Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Jonathan Lethem, award-winning American novelist, essayist, and short story writer. You may know him for Motherless Brooklyn, Fortress of Solitude. Uh, his more recent books are Feral Detective and The Arrest. Uh, my first book that I read was Gun with Occasional Music. And uh, today we're going to be talking about his new book, um, as well as just noir in general, Brooklyn Crime Novel. Uh, Mr. Lethem, wonderful to have you on today. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is fun, and um, yeah, gun with occasional music. That means you were you were there at the start, or if you didn't read it when it came out, you still you 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 know about the early. You know, a lot of people um, treat me as if I sort of began with Motherless Brooklyn, which was my fifth right. novel. So sometimes I have to kind of do this. Um, labored rewind where I say, well, actually, th there were four books before that. And actually, I had wrote a whole book about a private detective before that one, you know, but yeah, uh, no, I um. so I mean, when you talk about like my favorite writers of all time, it's Raymond Chandler and Philip K. Dick. So, of course, I, <laughs> there was no for, way like for gun with uh, occasional music, which was yes, the algorithm. Yes. All I all I did really was want to want to see if I could kind of cross uh, cross fertilize or splice those two voices together in that book. I mean, of course there are other, there are other elements. There's, there's, there are other hard boiled detective writers like Ross McDonald, uh, in the mix and, and James Crumley was influential on me, but, um, but I was obsessed with Chandler and Philip K. Dick at that point. I, I have, have sort of always been. And, um, you know, it, I remember when <laughs> someone wanted to, blurb the book or review the book saying this is a, a this is the exact midpoint between Raymond Chandler and Philip Kiddick and somebody as as does happen someone was sort of wanting to be protective of me or defensive they said well that's comparisons are you know bes beside the point you're your own writer and I was like no 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 that's exactly what it is <laughs> <laughs> yes I couldn't oh, think of a better thing to say that's fine yeah 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 I mean, uh, for someone who's a fan of those two writers, it was kind of like a dream come true. Even the fact that you stole that Thank line you. from Raymond Chandler about the uh, uh, the kangaroo, he, like the the bouncer at the bar or the the hitman at the bar or whatever, looked like a kangaroo in a dinner jacket. And you're like, I'm just going to write a book about an actual whole kangaroo. book about the I kangaroo in the dinner jacket. Yeah. Well, you know, in a way that um, the movement from that that Chandler quote, where he's obviously putting the kangaroo in uh, figurative language, he doesn't mean that anyone would be confused and think it was anything other than a human being, but it's a way of talking about the way how out of sorts this guy looks in his dinner jacket. But the kind of creative misunderstanding of pretending to believe that he means it's actually a kangaroo, um, I think represents a really big part of how my early writing organizes itself over and over and over again, which is that I take something that in another writer's lexicon would be figurative, and I kind of concretize it into metaphor. I take it absolutely literally, and then I'm like, and what does that leave us with? Um, and, and you know, you can see instances of my doing that all through the early short stories and the first few novels, where I take something that, you know, could be read poetically or metaphorically, and I, I just sort of decide to, um, to, 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 to act as though I don't understand metaphor <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a fascination there, uh, you know, with metaphor, but just a fascination with language itself, which seems to come out in your writing often, right? Um, that's, I think, part of the reason that people really uh, connect it. Like, the reason Motherless Brooklyn was so successful is that you see, like, the Tourette's becomes this incredible exploration of, like, this inner language structure. And then we start right. to recognize bits of that language structure in our own heads. Well, I hope that it involves a lot of recognition. That was the source of the book for me was 
learning about Tourette syndrome from reading about it in Oliver Sacks essays and feeling this immense and at the time completely uh, inexplicable sense of identification. You know, I'd never been diagnosed. I still never have been diagnosed as having uh, suffering from Tourette syndrome. And I'm, if, if in any sense I, I could be identified in a literal way with that syndrome, I would be one of its most fortunate sufferers because the people who cope with having it are, are, have a very heavy burden to carry and their families suffer. And, and I don't experience any of that. But nevertheless, there was something about the description of the reactivity, the way that people with Tourette's felt about their own brains and their own uh, um, connection to language and the way it moved through them that made me think, well, this is sort of a description of, of something in me. And so I wanted to, uh, in a way, reverse engineer that feeling of recognition and make every reader feel that for the duration of reading the novel, that maybe they also would feel this enormous degree of empathy or, or even, you know, identification with the situation. Yeah, and I, I don't want to uh, stray too far. I know that part of this, and it's just the the life of the writer, is that you are here in part to to push your your new novel, you know, Brooklyn crime novel. Oh um, no, let's not yeah. push anything. No, no pushing. <laughs> we're we're just having a conversation. But you know, I mean, anything we might say coming out of describing first Gun of the Casual Music, and then, um, and and then Motherless Brooklyn will point directly to the existence of this new novel, which is so much about both Brooklyn and about the idea of the um, the language of the hard-boiled and the way it's a form of coping, or I've come to view it as a form of coping with experiences of trauma, disturbance, criminality, culpability, <laughs> you know, yeah. all of this stuff that for so long for me has resided kind of implicitly in the idea of my love for crime fiction, for the hard-boiled narration. I tried to unpack that in a way in a way to put it under a kind of almost put it on the, you know, analyst couch in this new book to say, you know, why must I feel hard-boiled about these things? Why do I want to make kind of snappy jokes about being a criminal or being a victim all the time? You know, what's what's the source source code in me that yeah. makes this necessary? And what does it have to do with Brooklyn? <laughs> yeah. I, even in the beginning of the book, you you talk about um, the, I wouldn't say the danger, but yet, like you feel yourself trying to hide behind these lush metaphors, which is just like very indicative of like Raymond Chandler's writing, right? Um, you talk yeah. about like the honeyed light coming through and all of a sudden you're like the the narrator halts, right? And it's like, Wait, wait, wait. I mean, let's not let's not make this nostalgic. Let's just the just the facts, right? And um, but then you even turn on on that as well. And uh was it was there a specific um you know, it's always a danger of these kinds of books. You you grew up in Brooklyn. It's obvious that some of this is at least some uh semi autobiographical. And For then sure. like it's hard not to read you into um the novelist sitting at the bar. And the wheeze is poking at the novelist, uh, you know, even the uh, the take me to the bridge and the the T-shirts that show up and stuff. I have like how much of that is uh, something that you've experienced and how much of that is invented or is that just a terrible question? No, it's a great question. I mean, and it's it's this is my first chance. This is one of the earliest conversations I, I will have had about the details of this book with someone who's read it and, and has got me, you know, uh, sat me down for a, a extensive interview of any kind. And that in, includes people who might, you know, write a, a print piece or, or any other podcaster. So it's really my chance to figure out what people are going to want to talk to me about, but I'm not shocked that that, that chapter where suddenly there's a novelist who's, written about his boyhood in Brooklyn and all the other characters kind of hate on him. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that that's, that's one of the things I'm going to be required to account for. You know, um, my friend, uh, uh, dear friend, and the, the brilliant writer Dana Spiota 
said to me uh, when she read the manuscript, she said, um, you know, people talk about punching up or punching down. And um, you obviously chose the third path, which is punch self. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> so, you know, I think in a way that, I mean, I hope that scene is, is very funny. I, I felt that it was one of the funniest I'd written in any of my books. And it has a very definite source in um, Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions, which is a novel he wrote in the kind of late middle of his career where he lets his characters uh, argue with him in person and meet him and, and accuse him of things. The guy sitting at that bar who wrote the book called Take Me to the Bridge isn't like 100% uh, me and Take Me to the Bridge isn't 100% The Fortress of Solitude. But I wanted to raise the specter of this because if this book was to do all the things I wanted it to do, to be so scrupulously honest about my confusion about coming of age inside that place, time and place, the, the gentrification, the racial dynamics of that neighborhood. And I really wanted to lay bare everything that I knew. One of the strangest elements is that, of course, I enter the story at a certain point. And if I'm looking at it in 2019, 2020, which is when I began writing this book, I'm looking at a place that among its defining characteristics is that a guy wrote a novel about growing up there and froze, in a way, certain ideas about the gentrification of the neighborhood into place in 20 years earlier. Now, I don't mean that everyone cares about Fortress of Solitude. I don't want to suggest that this is a vanity that, that now I'm very important to the people who live in the neighborhood. But as an ingredient in my own <laughs> very complicated um, exploration of my feelings about this place, the fact that I tried to do it once before, you know, in a, in a kind of monumental or, or panoramic, I think that's the right word, sort of uh, version, which at the time I myself took as the last word I would ever need to have about it. I, I thought it was exhaustive. And I was exhausted. I didn't think I was going to write about Brooklyn again after the Fortress of Solitude. So here I was 20 years later, forced by all kinds of circumstance, but also allowed by all sorts of extraordinary opportunities, among them just simply that I was still alive and working, um, to go at it again and try to get it even more the way I understood it or the way I was newly capable of understanding it. Because the time had changed me and the time had changed the neighborhood and the time had changed everyone's capacities for thinking about these incredibly painful realities. And... I couldn't have written this book, Brooklyn Crime Novel, any earlier than I did. It took all of those accumulated changes in myself and, and in the world to make uh, even attempting this book um, possible. So looking at time itself and the strangeness of living long enough with your memories that you've tried to hold them up to the light at multiple different passages in your own journey and succeeded, failed, uh, and in some cases made, made your success or your failure very public, made, made them part of the conversation. Uh, this had to be part of the story too. So the presence of a novelist who the people who lived in the neighborhood felt uh, ambivalently about at best you know, this was actually one of the things that that um, was my way into the book. That scene isn't an incidental, amusing, you know, like, oh, now let's go meta and be funny for a while. It was one of the sources of the, of the whole project was that I, you know, when I published Fortress of Solitude, I, I went on book tour, but I used to joke it wasn't really a book tour, it was a listening tour. People who had strong feelings about the things I'd written about had a lot to say to me, and that was an intensely meaningful uh, for me and left me with all kinds of new 
associations and memories and perplexities to, to sit with. And I see this new book as an outgrowth of that conversation. And I made this deliberate in the process of beginning to write it. I, um, I talked to dozens of people I'd grown up with, people my age, who lived through the gentrification of Gowanus in the 70s and 80s and had lots to say about it. And I, I put myself in a deliberate, <laughs> uh, you know, crossfire of, of strong feeling so that I could write a book now that was m- much larger than just my own kind of pitiable <laughs> perspective. But so the fact that, you know, some of the people I wanted to talk to were like, yeah, not that impressed with the Fortress of Solitude or, uh, or hadn't bothered to read it or, <laughs> or, liked it, or liked it at the time, but now wondered how it would hold up. You know, that was part of the feeling I had was, yeah, you know, I, I'm proud of that book, but wow, you can live a lot longer than your, your certainties. And I had done so. Uh, that does seem to be a, a common uh, human thing is to, to outgrow your certainties. Um, I, I'm going to try and tie together a couple strands here. So forgive me if this is a little longer. But um, one thing that kind of comes up is how um, there, are, there is a good amount of trauma in the book and the way that trauma often gets flattened. Uh, there's a conversation between uh, rememberers about cops and crooks. Um, and one of the things that um, I was curious about, even as we talk about this this flattening process, as you as you were working through this yourself in Fortress of Solitude, um, is uh, I believe it's um, the Wheeze, or no, no, it's not the Wheeze. It's the narrator of the book talking about how uh, his frustration with the novelist was that the novelist had stolen all their stories and forced it into one character. Yeah. For the sake of the story, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm I'm curious if that is part of the reason for for me for the some, most of the other books that I've read by you. This structure seems pretty experimental, right? I mean, you have uh, a lot of different things going on. The storylines are really distended and um, nonlinear, and uh, it's very confusing at first. Um, uh, not in a bad way, but it's like what. Where are we going? Right, it's like, like a plate you're spinning jumping act. years. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like when, um, when when the guy's rushing over to another part of the stage with another broomstick and a plate, you might be like, "Well, wait, why are you going over there? Couldn't you just stay with these ones?" You know, it's like it's really. I know it's 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 a very unusual structure. Yeah. But the is that part of your way of trying to avoid that uh, complaint from the narrator that the the novelist flattened it into a single character by having all these. These kind of vignette approach. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you're, you're, you're encouraging me enormously that you're able to frame that question on those terms. It suggests at least some part of what I want to put across is really there to be found, at least by a sympathetic reader. And that is precisely that, um, you know, the, the way I was able with my sixth novel, The Fortress of Solitude, to write something so large and that tackled so many different kinds of confusion and intensity was to adopt a genre, which is the the method that I'd always used. I adopted a whole series of genres preceding that. I'd, I'd written a Western and a science fiction novel and a crime novel. And so with The Fortress of Solitude, I also adopted a genre, and that's the one known as the Bildungsroman, the coming of age novel. And you know, this is recognizable, even if one doesn't know that word, in a comparisons like um, Charles Dickens, you know, David Copperfield, or, or Great Expectations, um, you know, or American novels like Call It Sleep by Henry Roth. Um, it's usually, very typically, a larger novel, often written by a, a young man, about coming of age. And it can do a lot of, you know, I mean, another one that was very influential on me when I was very young, one of the first kind of big grown-up novels I ever read was Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham. You know, 
these books can do a lot of portraying social milieu and um, and explaining time and place, but they're always centered in the consciousness and the vulnerabilities and the sensibility of this person who's coming of age. And so I adopted this method for Fortress of Solitude because it was the only way I could imagine tackling everything at that point. And it did mean that I drew a lot of uh, different forms of experience and perception into the space of this one central consciousness, this uh, approximate stand-in for myself. Now, the character Dylan Ebdis is not me in many respects. I mean, I, I, I always point out uh, to people who are, seem, seem to want the identification to be 100% that, you know, Dylan Ebdis couldn't have written The Fortress of Solitude. His, his limitations are so extreme and, and, and they, they have to do with a lot of circumstances that are, you know, blessings in my life that I sort of denied him. Dylan has no siblings. Dylan lives in a big, lonely house with only his father, who is also socially isolated. Um, Dylan doesn't connect with any of his teachers in school. Dylan, apart from this one crucial friendship with Mingus, doesn't have a lot of connection on the street. He doesn't have a lot of friends. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to form identifications with very many other people. I was, in that sense, I was his opposite. I had siblings who were also emissaries into this neighborhood. I lived in a very abundantly social space because my house was a commune full of adults younger than my parents who were really interested in me, and I was really interested in them, and they taught me a lot. And I connected brilliantly with a couple of key school teachers who, you know, at times, as teachers can do, it felt like they saved my life, you know, psychologically, emotionally. So I, I took all of these advantages away from Dylan to, ex, to exaggerate his isolation and, and vulnerability. Um, but anyway, I, I bundled all of the experience into this one character. And in that act of bundling, of course, in a sense, I, I created a kind of a mythic version of my own experience, one where... Uh, you know, there was only one white boy in all of Brooklyn. Well, that's not really the case. I mean, there were so many white boys, even in this somewhat reverse minority situation that I experienced, for instance, in my, in my public schools. You know, I wasn't one of one. I was one of seven or one of 12 in a given public school. And on my block, there were plenty of other white kids around. It was a very intricate mix, which is what I tried to depict in this new book. So I did want to explode that, that uh, myth and distribute the book as totally as I could. And in, in, the, in so doing, I created another subject matter for myself, of course, which is that it examines the whole procedure of storytelling and the way memory simplifies. Because once I decided to expand instead of contract and show dozens of different characters, too many to remember or name, then I in instituted this sort of tension, the one you experienced when you called it confusing, but then you wanted to say, but in a good way. You know, I was exploding the very method that stories tend to thrive on. And in its place, I had to put other kinds of thinking, including thinking about stories and what we want from them. You know, why do we, why do we want them simplified? Why do we need them simplified, perhaps, in order to survive? Yeah, I mean, um, I have down here, and this is a follow-up question, um, and I, you know, I, I'm glad because it shows we're kind of on the same train of thought. Um, the perplexities that come from these sorts of things um, and the way that people will even project memories. Um, but more than that, just the way things get fabricated after the fact. And I, I think especially, Absolutely. you know, you investigate this in terms of like the keening on the concrete, the, um, the, uh, can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, you've already talked about a little bit, but I think that's a great example of what you're talking about. Um, that this method of, of projection that people do with their childhood? Well, so the more I thought about and opened myself to 
other voices and then sought them out and layered them into my thinking about this project, the more I realized that one of my interests and so an inevitable subject within the book would be uh, collective memories, things that are understood, and not just memories, but ideas, things that float in an intersubjective social space. And I started to think about the kids in the neighborhood uh, as a body, a kind of mental body that even the friends and the enemy that the friends and even the enemies were all in a way experiencing and thinking together. And sometimes this would lead to uh, revelatory experiences of communal knowing that some somehow this like sense of super transmission of an idea, like, of course, we all know that we are uh, paying a toll, like the the, the money in the sock is a kind of ritual. Who started it? Who invented it? How was it transmitted? How did everyone know to do it? You know, did, it's like a joke. Did some kid make up the joke first? Everyone tells the joke. Um, and then also that there were individual images of experience, trauma, conflict, that would enter into collective memory and then become confusing. You know, like like sort of like the way... There are hundreds of thousands more, you know, Mets fans who believe they 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 watched the ball go through Bill Buckner's legs in Game Six in 1986 than could ever possibly have actually done so. They weren't watching live. They weren't in the stadium. They just, but the experience was transmitted into their bodies. That that there would be legendary stories of trauma and conflict that would become transmitted and then seized up as individual experience or or transmitted just on a one-to-one -one basis like you like the keening on the pavement that happened to you and you you made me feel that it happened to me and then I spent two decades believing it happened to me and then one day I was able to somehow reaward that experience you know you know, it's like, God damn it. You just, it's like you, it's ventriloquism, you know, memory yeah. ventriloquism. Yeah. You threw it into my body. Hmm. Well, speaking of uh, trauma, um, first off, we're, uh, my family's a Red Sox family. So uh, I just want to <laughs> Sorry to and... bring that up. I had an inkling. <laughs> I was being very <laughs> malicious. I'm sorry. Oh, man. Yeah. No, no, all good. All good. Um, yeah. The, uh, Oh, that's just a whole other, I man, talk about memories in the body. Uh, cause I was not alive for that, but, uh, I, that, that is, that is a childhood Still memory of that pain. being retold, yeah. um, of, uh, my dad pulling, uh, my mom onto his lap as they were watching is like, honey, for the first time in my life, I'll be able to look at a Yankees fan and say, we finally, yeah, we won the world series. And then it's just like hit, hit, hit. And then, uh, I mean, I've heard, I mean, it is family folklore, right? And yeah. my mom like looked over at my dad and he just didn't respond at all. Just was staring at the TV and she just got up and went to bed and he just never moved. Right. He just, he didn't even. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that really comes out and, you know, there are, seems to be some moments where the contradictions poke through, uh, through so sharply that uh, it began to unravel and end kind of this this shared space, this body of knowledge. Um, but really what, what's apparent throughout is like just the contradictions were so sharp. Even as we're talking about the dance, the way that like civil rights had happened and the parents know that they want their kids to be, you know, their white kids to be with the black kids, right? But at the same we time, there like, to, and we were there to emblematize this transformation that they all were shareholders in. So we needed not to disappoint them. Yeah. But you also had like, here's your mugging money, right? Like at the same time. And so, and even like the, the black kids are, are talking to you and they're like, you know, th there's this weird language about it, but then it kind of ends with, um, and this is, uh, you, you talk about, um, I, I think it's a, 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 something I'd love to hear from you on, um, 
why crimes? You know, uh, and maybe this is the answer, right? That like it's the crimes that were the beginning and the ends of these, like these bookends. But yeah. um, you know, it's the Brooklyn crime novel, and you, you kind of start off talking about how you're going to trace the crimes throughout. Um, and one of the clear ones is this uh, something that's actually quite childish, but really very disturbingly serious at the same time. That kind of happens at the end of the book. I'll, you know. I don't give away too many spoilers for your book, but um, can you speak to that that tracing of crime throughout? Well, so if if um, one of the things that uh, one of the senses in which Fortress of Solitude left an opportunity to say more and think harder was this, at the time, necessary kind of romantic conflation of experience into one, you know, little white kid's sensibility. Another form was that the book, because it was a entry into thinking about uh, trauma and 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 victimization, it only got a certain distance into the understanding that I began to reckon with that in a weird way, we were all criminals as well as victims on those streets. Every single one of us participated in, I mean, in a literal sense, whether it was graffiti or, or, um, or shoplifting, uh, or sometimes also, uh, you didn't just cause you were eligible to yoke to be yoked didn't mean you didn't also yoke someone else. You know, everyone, there's this, the great soul song, everybody plays the fool. You know, everybody finds somebody to bully at some point. Um, but also we were rendered criminal atmospherically. We were all furtive. We were all conspirators. We were all um, enablers or witnesses. We were all enmeshed in conspiracies of the street. And this was so basic to me that I was, a, you know, I think it took, in a funny way, uh, it took parenting kids of my own to realize they were not growing up as little criminals. <laughs> you know, they might, you know, they might, who knows, they might be smoking a joint as I speak, but that's not what I mean. They weren't <laughs> suffused in criminality. And it wasn't just because I'd yeah, happened yeah. or more than happened. I'd arranged for them to grow up in a, in a, on streets where they, they weren't going to need to carry mugging money, but it was because the world had changed and that actually I'd grown up in a very strange time and place. One that was deeply exotic as the years covered it over in memory, you know, that, that this fundamental criminality of the space we were in, the whole city was criminal. New York was a criminal and it was a crime scene and it was a, it was a victim all at once, you know, went forward, uh, the famous headline, Ford to City Drop Dead. The, the way that galvanized identity in the city at the time was like, of course, fuck yeah, he wants us to drop dead because we're, we're, we're badass and we're his problem <laughs> and and we're you know, uh, it was like the 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 footing of existence was criminal in that in that time and place, and that through all of the particular activities, whether they were gentrification or a mugging or you know a teenage murder attempt one upon another, uh, into a a specific framework. The uh, as you talk about the knowledge of the body, um, you have these parents who come in. They have their ideals and they have their identities majorly formed, and so it's pretty interesting to see just that huge gap because the parents can't even begin. They have some idea, but they can't even begin to grasp the chasm, and that's quite that comes up yeah. quite a bit. Um, uh, you reference it a little bit, I think, with um, the millionaire son um, with Sparkle, and I can't remember what he calls his his dad, you know, that the idea of like families don't speak to each other. 
Um, yeah. The uh, but yeah, this, well, they're this just the most the body, egregious. Uh, they're a, the, yeah, they're an exaggerated right. <laughs> version of something that's really going on in almost every house on the street in that book. Uh, the 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 with very very rare exceptions, the 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 universal law of childhood at that time was that the parents it was not even worth trying to explain to them the meaning of our lives on the street. And there might be motives bundled into that. We want to protect them from disappointment or from being worried about us or we're embarrassed. We're unable to transmit their values into the space that they're sending us. But it was just a baseline condition. And even before the motives entered into it, it was like, nah, no way. They just can't imagine. They just have no idea. And that was the collectivity that formed the group mind of the kids was this certainty that they, again, whether that person was your, a stranger, the kid was a stranger to, to, to you or a sworn enemy, an instinctive enemy, you still were allied with them in this knowledge that the world that the adults were projecting was a gigantic uh falsehood um i'm familiar with this from the work of charles taylor and he's referencing pierre uh, bordeaux um or bordeaux i'm probably saying it wrong but the um in between like the mannerisms and routines um and culture there's what they call habitus i don't know if you're familiar with the term <laughs> i I, uh, I have come, come of, across it yeah Yes, yeah, and this idea of uh, a collection of mannerisms and routines, and, and it's the habitus is so um, the culture is so thick, right? This this culture in the body is so thick. The way that uh, the difference between uh, one sidewalk and the next, and one set of milk crates, one stoop and the next, um, and it's so impenetrable, and and that really seems to me to. That's what I came away with is that even when that chasm, they tried to cross that chasm to a parent, right? It'd be like uh, over and over again, you talk about um, a child being like actually reaching out to a parent saying, hey, they stole this. And then the parent would follow. And of course, they just, it's not that they don't know who the parent, other parent is, the other kid is. It's just, it melts away into the street. And it's just this, in, uh, what looks so simple is actually so inextricably intertwined in in the uh um not just the the subculture created but just like all the individual mannerisms and routines that i just govern even the smallest little territories uh the spaces um, absolutely it's, it's really like a completely really un, un uh, inexpressible language of particular scenes and circumstances that uh can't it just can't it's inchoate it can't be ter termed with with uh the language of the parents they they don't have any any framework for for the knowledge that the children are experiencing on the street and and uh transmitting one to the other and uh, and this is where i think you use the term phenomenological in the in the book but like there mm -hmm. there seems to be this effort with this book to create a language for the white spaces, for the silences, for the gutters mm -hmm. that even happen yeah. in books, but even that was especially like what you're you're investigating is this this hidden knowledge and trying to give voice to that. Is that a fair uh, is that a fair way to characterize the book? I like that description very much. I mean, you know, so uh, I can be very weak on uh, <laughs> philosophical terminology, even when I fling it around a little bit myself. I'm I think in. I think in material terms, bodily terms, I mean that in 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 fictional terms, characters and situations, set pieces, experiences, motivations. And so, you know, which which is another way of explaining the the need to entrench my first approach to this work in Fortress of Solitude in the the coming of age story was it was the only methodology I had. And I've gotten both further away from that, you know, uh, bodily knowledge from the, my sense of presence in that space. I'm geographically further away from it as well as it happens, which may or may not be helpful. Um, but 
I also have absorbed some other kinds of frameworks. And so when you use word like habitus or uh, point out to me that I use the word phenomenology, I think, yeah, I did, you know, I've been in academic circles now for a decade and I did bring some other kinds of tools as much as I view myself as alien to them or, or, um, you know, uh, only coming to them, you know, the way like a cat walks through a, a house, like just, you know, cat doesn't have a map of the house in their head. They just go where they go. But, you know, another term that was available to me was um, the, the idea from the social sciences of the um, self-ethnography, which I saw as an attractive description, but also it came with its own critique which is that the, anyone who tries to do an ethnography of themselves is going to be lost within their own uh, assumptions and language. So I needed to try one and critique it at the same time. Uh, and this book, I think, represents an attempt to um, utilize this idea of self-ethnography and uh, shake, it, shake it out of its assumptions relentlessly. So that's why the book stops and contradicts itself so frequently. Or just falls off a cliff of the unknown, says, this is, this is a place I, I, sorry, I can't help you here. I, yeah. I'm unwilling to presume. Um, but um, yes, uh, there was a certain commitment to phenomenology. I think it's true. I was sort of deciding that if I could just say enough with kind of remorseless uh, but not judgmental precision about some of these occurrences, maybe I'd get somewhere. I didn't know where, and I wasn't going to make any giant claims for its utility, but I'd be somewhere. And, you know, I also, I, I'm a... What I am is not a philosopher or a phenomenologist. I'm also not, by training, and by that I mean self-training, really, by, by autodidactic training, I'm not a realist. What I am is a surrealist. But one of the things that makes surrealism work, if you understand it, is that it, re it requires the introduction of elements of almost microscopically scrupulous realism. You know, the reason Max Ernst's collages are so disturbing to look at is that he's collaging together these very, very precise engravings that are illustrations from various other stories. And so my commitment to surrealism, in one sense, uh, brought me to a place where I realized if I, if I could be unsentimental leave out the honeyed light, leave out the coming of age, and talk about this past in, in, it, in its particularities, in its phenomenological particularities, that it would yeah. be surreal because I'd lived so long that such facts as I had in my body, if I could free them onto the page, would strike people who had not lived in that time and place as absolutely beyond belief. I, I want to come back to that. Uh, I'm still a little bit stuck. Um, I love the idea of a cat going through the house of academia because uh, one of the things that everyone knows about cats is they have an inappropriate but undeniable sense of ownership and uh, independence. <laughs> you know, like there's something here like uh, you can't tell a cat what to do, but it definitely, and it has the run of the house. and. Um, I think there is something, um, there, you know, I said inappropriate, but I say there's something appropriate about your use of phenomenology and the remorselessness does, I think, um, detail real structures of, of consciousness, of experience. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to uh, push too far into this, but I, I do, what do you think is the philosophical value? Or even um, if we want to really uh, stretch the, the boundaries of things, the, what do you think is the, the value for uh, the pursuit of truth in what you're doing? 
when you when you write something like Brooklyn crime novel? Well, I'm going to try to circumscribe my claims very tightly because your your question is a terrible uh, invitation to pomposity and and over <laughs> over over claims. But I recognize still that there is a, a truth pursuit uh, and, and, and some truth result. But I'll just say it's, it was for, for me. I, am, I, am, I have reoccupied my experience with a scrupulousness that freed me from fear. Uh, so it was a personal result. And I just don't know its value to others, especially pre-publication. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but really, yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. how can I ever uh, secure any confidence about what that value may be to others? I'm sure it will be disturbing uh, in its implications, but there, there may be, um, uh, you know, it may, it may, may generous, generate um, meaning. I just say meaning for other people. I, I hope it does. But the truth value was for myself. I think there is a, a general, I mean, and this is uh, a lot of my own work has been done in interpretation and in philosophy of art. And one thing I've always appreciated about your writing um, is the, as that remorseless pursuit of, of experience. The way uh, uh, that, and I, I think when, when you talk about that, I think, uh, of course, the experience itself is valuable, but opening people up to someone uh, internal processing uh, encourages people to do the same kind of internal processing. And I think there's something valuable in just like um, that kind of, uh, in, in the same way, you know, we, we talk about a novel. But when we have conversations with friends and we have uh, someone is brutally honest about something and yeah. uh, the, that moment of recognition is, is I think, valuable. And so I, I think that there is something, there is something intersubjective about this subjective pursuit, if I could put it that way. Um, so uh, one, thank you. It was a tremendous read and it was, um, it was valuable to me, at least. I mean, it's pre-publication, so at least you have one. That's great. <laughs> that's that's great to hear. <laughs> and this has been a really exciting conversation for me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, one more question, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. I want to be conscious of your time. Um, the, uh, I, I would love to dwell on the hard-boiled language and the, the value of noir to yourself and what you think it right. provides to kind of American culture in general, yeah, and even just the, the human experience. What, when you say, I mean, clearly, you know, you talk about this as a pursuit of truth, mainly for yourself. And there's this, you talk about the true hard boiled and the Bugs Bunny hard boiled. <laughs> Can you talk about a little bit of that evolution and even sure. that, um, what yeah. that provides, maybe that remorselessness? Yeah. Well, so one of the things that I am very conscious of is the, is the transmission, the, the kind of, um, echo effect of, of the invention of the hard-boiled voice as it moves into popular culture and it becomes um, Baroque, basically. It becomes a kind of a mannerism that uh, is separated from its uh, innate origins and meanings. And I'm a great example. I think I, you know, as I've joked in a few different places, I, I, I knew about Humphrey Bogart I mean, who is himself recursive, not not a point of origin. But I knew about him through Bugs Bunny before I knew about him directly, you know. And um, and as I've interrogated twentieth century popular culture, which is just this field of, you know, whether it's Hollywood films or 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 rock and roll, science fiction, and the hard boiled detective voice. And, and a number of other kinds of objects, uh, Marvel Comics, I, I'm often returned to this understanding that the thing that I'm most responsive to uh, was often created by traumatized war veterans 
whether it's Rod Serling or Jack Kirby or so many of the hard-boiled, early hard-boiled writers, the Black Mask writers, and of course their, their secret master, Ernest Hemingway. And this idea that it is an encoding of a fundamental disaster of the violence of modernity. That is to say, basically, World War I and then, and then World War II, from which we have never recovered. The, the disenchantment with modernity, the shock of mechanized death that was possible. And that the detective wears a trench coat, not because it looks cool, but because he's returned from trench warfare, which at the time was a, just named a, a, a kind of trauma that's unimaginable, almost impossible to reconstruct its vastness. And that this was what the voice was for, just as the surrealists were attempting to recover from World War I. The hardball detective voice was an attempt to manage trauma. That, that the, the story of, of these forms of distortion or figuration was they were rooted in um, incommensurable experiences of pain and disappointment with what the 20th century had presented. And that that was what we were really talking about. Or not talking about. Right, right, right. Uh, talking around it. Kind of a, a yeah. language uh, creating its own spaces uh, inside itself. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, one, let me say again, thank you. It's been a, a real uh, joy and honor to have you on. Um, what is something that you, uh, what's one takeaway you would leave for our audience uh, for this week as they, they listen here, or one thing you'd encourage them to do? Besides read your book, obviously, which is phenomenal. So I'll put that up one more time. But. Well, uh, that's an incredible, wide open question. What would I have them do? Yes. <laughs> Attend. I'm going to do this on Saturday. If you if you've even heard of this thing, attend a sound bath, and you can you can look it up. <laughs> Retune yeah, your instrument. Attend a sound bath. Retune your instrument. The 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 tuning fork deep in your body is hungry for this experience, and and you don't know it. It feels like. Um... It feels like an ending as enigmatic as your book. I, I really appreciate that. That's, I, I have no <laughs> idea you, what a sound bath is. I'll have to go look it up later. If you can't find your way to a sound bath, go to a, go to a hardcore punk show and get in the mosh pit because it's similar. Different, but similar. Yes, cathartic. <laughs> yes. Go see some live music. Much Love simpler. But I'll, I'll look up sound bath later. Um, uh, Mr. Letham, it's been a, a, a joy. Um, thank you. My pleasure. This was great. 